go ahead and get this one going. Laura Dawn, how are we doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. I'm glad we were able to get this one going. And uh, yeah, just go ahead and let everybody know who you are and we'll jump into it. Well, that's a, a large question. It's who <laughs> I am. Um, well, I right now I'm studying, I'm in graduate school and I am pausing. I've been leading retreats for 10 years. And so I'm taking a break with everything that's happening with the pandemic to go back to graduate school. And uh, I'm really interested in the overlap between psychedelics and creative problem solving. And I've been an entrepreneur my whole life. I've been living a very alternative lifestyle for many years now. And um, yeah, just with everything that's up with the pandemic and um, with how fast and rapid everything is changing these days, um, I thought I would take this opportunity to uh, dive into my education and the next level education in my life to explore and study something that really interests me. I think that's pretty awesome. And I, I believe that psychedelics are the future like, of human evolution, because I think there, there are so many things that we can get from these, uh, these wonderful plant medicines. Um, mm -hmm. But let's take it back a little bit where where are you from so i grew up in montreal and ah. i've been living on the big island for almost 10 years now okay. and i was raised by two entrepreneurs and the youngest of four children and yeah i um i've always had a very curious mindset i started working with psychedelics when i was about 14 15 years old and that's when i had my first high dose psilocybin trip and um started intuitively microdosing when I was in high school. I also went through some, you know, just like most people do in their teens, some depression and um, just a general sense of, of confusion around why I was on this planet and what it was all for and really just looking for answers and solutions. So I've kind of always been in this seeking mentality and was very rebellious. I grew up in the, the rave scene and, you know, wasn't just like conscious use of psychedelics. I was really dabbling into all full range of, of you know, the, the harder stuff and, and alcohol as well. And um, my parents were always really supportive of me and my choices. One thing that I really appreciated about my mother so much was that she always told me, even just the other day, she said it again, well, I trust that you make good decisions. And so she always gave me that confidence that I knew that I, I'll make the right choices, even when I'm, you know, was experimenting with uh, a whole bunch of different substances. And, you know, they didn't love that, but they, they always loved me and supported me through all of that. And um, yeah, the having two parents for entrepreneurs and my, my father, I, I really, a lot of the work that I do now with people is around microdosing and teaching people what it means to embody the visionary archetype. And I really got a lot of that from my father, who I consider to be a visionary, and from psychedelics. Psychedelics have taught me so much about what it means to go within and to explore a, an entire universe um, that lies within us and all around us, but that, that lies beyond which our eyes can see. And so that was, I like to joke that, you know, because I started working with psychedelics from such a young age that um, psychedelics hand raised me and forged me into the adult I am today. Wow, that's, that's quite the journey so far. Um, yeah, that's, that's a very interesting way to grow. I, I feel like that is not the norm at all, um, or at least the norm that I experienced growing up. Uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm from Ohio, so grew up in the Midwest, and it's, it's, it's a very, you know, there's a lot of stigma that still lingers that, that, that people are into and um mm -hmm. yeah it's it's interesting was it was was psychic or were psychedelics always discussed with your family growing up is that why it was like so like easy easy for you when you started well I have an older brother who's 10 years older than me so when I was about eight he was 18 and he went traveling and you know would tell me some stories about these big magical frogs and you know like he would do all he, he was going on some pretty big adventures as you do when you're that age and so 
he kind of instilled this this um, other fantasy realm that I knew was also possible to experience and especially being a child. Um, and so actually when, after I went to, I went to school, I got a um, degree in business and entrepreneurship and, and finance. And so it was interesting because my, my parents really instilled in us this uh, pressure to go to school and to, you know, if we were going to be uh, uh, living under their roof, it was kind of, that was the, the rule, you know? And so I went to school and it was really interesting to have worked with so many psychedelics and mind altering substances and then go through a very conventional program that taught about economics and stock markets. And I started also investing in the stock market when I was very young and did pretty well. And, um, and I hit a very rock bottom moment in my life where I had my first sort of out of body experience. I was I was working really hard and I was also struggling with a lot of things in my life and feeling like, you know, what is this all for? And during the week I was working really hard. And then during, on the weekends I would be, you know, over drinking and reaching for other substances to numb out and tune out. And then I hit this sort of rock bottom moment and I had this first real sort of out of body experience where I just had this realization hit me that this didn't have to be my life and that I could actually choose and that what was what was evident was that I needed to redefine what purpose and success meant for me because I was definitely on the fast track to you know quote unquote success and especially I was in a very uh, I don't want to say elite but it was like a very advanced program in finance where I was managing a portfolio of a million dollars with eight other students so I was just a kid that was managing two hundred and fifty thousand dollars of bonds and I was doing really well and you know we had a lot of the big companies cherry picking us for our future path, career paths. And I just didn't want that to be my life. And so I packed a backpack and I left and I never went back. And so I traveled all over the world. And during those years, like right after school, right after university, I dove really deep with psychedelics. And it was a major like deprogramming that happened you know I traveled and lived out of my bag for many years and went really deep just out way out there and uh, on secluded islands in Southeast Asia and you know just really exploring what it meant to be a human being living on this planet in this time and so it was kind of like another swing in the other direction of really watching a lot of conspiracy theory movies. You know, back then it was conspiracy. Alternative thinking was definitely not what it is in social media today. Getting exposed to just alternative um, ideas around the money system and the Federal Reserve and how money is really working and just planting different seeds of, of you know, questioning. And I think that was helpful at that time. and. It was definitely like more of a swing where my my family was really calling me, you know, the hippie label. And I um, was pretty, although, you know, my parents were very alternative mindset, had a very alternative uh, way of raising us right from the get-go. So I would have said it was deeper in those roots. But I met my ex-partner um, one day. He actually picked me up hitchhiking when I was backpacking across British Columbia and then I just spent a day with him. We were jumping in rivers and waterfalls. And then six months later to the day, I literally physically bumped into him in Thailand. And we spent some years together traveling around. And it was his family that taught me really how to uh, live off grid and live sustainably. He has many acres of beautiful land in British Columbia. And so after traveling around the world, I moved back home with him and really learned what it meant to... Uh, live, live, sustain from the land. So it was his mother who really taught me about gardening and just the amount of food production they had going on there was amazing and greenhouses and compost toilets and solar panels. And, and I've been living that way ever since. I ended up leaving that partnership, that relationship and came to Hawaii. And I sat in an ayahuasca ceremony where I had a vision that night that I was going to be that that was my home and I would be living on the big island and meeting my my future husband-to-be who I met that week and we ended up getting married and we've been on the big island for the past 10 years and psychedelics have played a really big role in terms of 
you know, go, tapping into these alternative visionary states, these altered states of consciousness and connecting to a vision of what we want to create with our lives. And so that's been my, my primary path ever since. It was like this coming around full circle to realizing that actually I have a gift in the understanding finance and entrepreneurship and business. It's been, it was how I was raised and how can I take that understanding that not a lot of people actually have. People want that. You know, and how do I apply that in a way that could be really beneficial? And so my husband and I set out and we bought our first raw 10 acres of land and it was totally raw, totally rugged. You know, for the first year and a half, we, um, we lived just with no power, no water. We slept in a little VW van that wasn't running anymore and we hauled it onto the land and we held a vision for building a retreat center where people could come and experience transformational healing. And um, that vision really drove us and motivated us and many miracles happened and aligned for us to be able to um, create that space. And eventually it was birthed. And I could keep going with this story because there's so much there. But when we bought the land, we didn't know that we were going to tap into a volcanic hot spring that we were sitting on top of a reservoir of 111 degree water. And so we, we ended up from a neighbor who um, invited us to soak in their hot spring. And then we realized, wow, okay, there's a potential for us to tap into hot water under our land. And so we took the, the leap of faith and we did that. And we ended up, um, we ended up drilling a well and building a volcanic hot spring retreat center and then two years ago, the volcano erupted and uh, everything changed for us again. And um, yeah, just riding all the waves of life. And it's, it's taught me a lot uh, about what it means to, to create. Wow. That is quite the perspective. Like that's, I, I feel like that's like a lived, lived movie, you know, like, mm -hmm. like people, People I've, I've talked to over the years um, and I've even, you know, had had thoughts of like, man, what would it be like to just to just pack up and leave? And, and you did it, you know, and it's it's amazing to see what happens when when you're actually following like what feels right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think the biggest takeaway, you know, because so many people are like, well, you held this vision of building this amazing space and then. When the volcano erupted, someone made us an offer because the, the land was so special that even while lava was flowing less than a mile from our land, someone made us an offer to buy the land. You know, so it was protected on so many levels and we ended up uh, selling it to, to another family. And so we still, after being away for about um, almost the majority of the past two years, we've just returned to the big island um, it was a, a pretty major trauma that we went through when we were evacuating all of our things. And, you know, it was just a lot of upheaval. And so we've been away mostly in Costa Rica. And now we just come back to the big island to sort of start again. And um, we have another 10 acres that we're, we're developing now and, and in a different way, you know, we're, we're just taking our time with it. And um, I do really look forward to the time that I can be continuing to lead retreats because that's just so my my passion I've been doing it for so long but one of the things that I tell people is that you know when we're creating it's not about the thing you know it's not about the thing that you manifest it's about who you become in the process and so this notion of being a visionary of holding a vision of what you want to create with your life and and really shaping yourself that vision shapes you and as you step up and become somebody who has the capacity to build a retreat center to write the books you know in the past two years i've also written two published books and really created a lot in a lot of different dimensions and that the retreat center and letting go of that after the volcanic eruption it, it reminded me so much of the traditions like the buddhist monks who create these beautiful mandalas in the sand and then they they wipe it clean and it's just the notion that you know we're it's not about the pursuit of accumulating things that's not the purpose and it's so amazing to be able to build a life that resonates with you and that you know that supports i love building spaces that then support my creative process to keep creating and and yet at the same time, you know, who I am, I am who I am. I'm the woman who I am because I went through that journey over years of 
planting fruit trees and you know living off of land that's off grid and you know building the retreat center was m one of the most challenging and yet rewarding times of my life and it's really about who you become along the way that's that's the core and no one can take that away from any of us you know so whether the thing is that you birth into this manifest reality whatever happens with it um that it's that's not really the purpose it's more about who you become in that process of creating yeah for sure wow some powerful stuff um was the the route uh, that you're on now with going back to to school was had you had you thought about that before the pandemic were you kicking around the idea or was this something that that came about because of the current times? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I have been thinking about next level for, for education, especially in the psychedelic space, because, you know, even though I've been working with psychedelics for over two decades now, a lot of people, uh, because it's like going towards the medical model, a lot of people who sort of dominate the, the psychedelic conferences and the speaking space are mostly psychologists. And so, you know, with psychedelic assisted psychotherapy, and I considered going towards that psychology route. I mean, I've been reading books on psychology. My mom's a counselor, you know, for, for years. And so I feel like that's definitely been one of the lenses in terms of how I, you know, interact with people and the way that I show up on this planet is really understanding the mind. And, and I'm also really into neuroscience and reading a lot of different uh, cross disciplines, positive psychology, behavioral psychology. Um, and so I really did consider going in that route. And um, after I just over New Year's launched the most successful retreat in my career, I had 40 people in Costa Rica leading a plant medicine ceremony with a group of mostly the people I work with are change makers, visionaries, entrepreneurs in the psychedelic space um, who want to learn how to tap into these visionary states to create more of a purpose, purposeful life. And so um, while I was preparing for that retreat, I had come across, because I've created a, a really unique framework for working with psychedelics, it's the, the creative visionary bodhisattva, and I can talk more about that. But I started um, coming across some of what Brene Brown uh, commented about her research. If you're familiar, she's, done, she's really known for her work in resilience and shame and courage and but she was on an episode with one of my other favorite authors, Elizabeth Gilbert, and they were talking about, um, was sharing about how about 80% uh, of all people have had experiences in childhood, especially from teachers who in, like planted in them a seed of a limiting belief. And of those 80%, about 50%, it was around creativity. And mm -hmm. I've had a lot of blocks around creativity and feeling like, I had a teacher tell me that I would never be creative because I couldn't draw. I'm still sort of horrified of drawing. And there's a, a cultural wide shift, a big narrative change around the importance of creativity and it's happening so much now. And the more I pay attention to that conversation, the more I'm recognizing, you know, there was a, a study by IBM where they interviewed 1600 executive leaders and managers across, you know, Fortune 500 companies and the full range. And now what, what a lot of different thought leaders, including Yuval Noah Harari, you know, other thought leaders that are really um, commenting on this time that we're living in specifically marked by exponential change, which is, you know, really hard to keep up with, that creativity and creative thinking and creative problem solving is the number one skill set we can learn to cultivate in the 21st century. And so that it was starting to come into the work that I was doing and noticing that I had to shift my own narrative about what it means to be a creative person. And that, you know, a lot of people have this, this narrative that there's creative people and then there's, and that's a very small portion of people and then there's everyone else. And so, yeah, it's been a, a, a real growth edge for me to, think, okay, how do I start enhancing cognitive flexibility? How do I start learning more tools for creative problem solving? So I started doing so much reading on it and reading books on the neuroscience of creativity and looking at this similar neurological underpinnings um, that 
in terms of what uh, psychedelics and sacred plant medicine support. They support neuroplasticity, they support cognitive flexibility. And so I was starting to create a lot of, of dots, you know, which is Steve Jobs' definition of creativity. Creativity is just connecting dots. And I've been microdosing for many years and microdosing also helps with pattern recognition. So I've been doing a lot of like, you know, mapping out conceptual frameworks for how people can be working with psychedelics, especially entrepreneurs and leaders who want to learn how to think more creatively, creative problem solving, cognitive flexibility, what does that look like? And then when the pandemic hit, I just thought, you know what, I'm not going to be going to, uh, I'm not going to be running a retreat for at least another year or two, maybe longer. And so why not just go? And I found a few programs that uh, specialized in creativity studies. So I'm getting a, a graduate master's degree. It's, it's a master's degree in science, but the program is creativity studies and change leadership. So it really is focusing on creativity in the more of like the corporate space. And I'm choosing to focus all of my, my electives and all the papers I'm writing, it all focuses on the overlap between creativity and psychedelics. Wow, wow, yeah. Man, are are you thinking about the the crossover to the corporate space? Is that where you're, you're... definitely? Yeah, I want to start be doing. I want to start doing um, uh, retreats for business teams. You know, people who work together, and so uh, and also building my own team of people who can support that in terms of um, embodied leadership and what that looks like, and team supporting uh, positive team dynamics and communication. And I think actually the direction that it's going, I mean, because I already work so much with entrepreneurs and change makers in the space that um, I'm, I'm curious to be applying more of the, these uh, specific st skills in creativity and how to enhance creativity towards like the corporate side and be working more with teams of people that already work together. And I, I think I think it's going to be an interesting area that opens up in the retreat space because now everyone is working so remotely that I I have the, the the vision that a lot of business teams are gonna actually want to start doing team retreats together to bring people together and have more cohesive time, even if it's 10 days or seven days, and then you know everyone goes back to working remotely again. Yeah, that makes a lot mm -hmm. of sense. Yeah. Because in our lifetime, we're gonna see the legalization of psychedelics and sacred plant medicines. It's already happening, you know? It's like Silicon Valley is already has companies that allow people to microdose at work, you know? So it's, it's, it's definitely happening. So obviously yeah. the work that I'm, I'm doing is not for everyone, but it's for specific people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What, uh, what has been one of the, the bigger things that you've, that you've noticed about uh, your, your research or your personal use with uh, microdosing? I think, you know, it's really been interesting. I'll give you an example. So. Um, a couple of years ago, I started another microdosing, another round of a microdosing protocol. And so I teach, I have uh, courses that I work with people because anyone can microdose, you know, and, and people can, can just microdose and go grocery shopping and go to work and that's yeah. fine. And I, you know, don't judge anyone for whatever practice they want to do. Yeah. But if people started also understanding the neural mechanisms of what's happening in the brain, how psychedelics support neuroplasticity how they can leverage that time to catalyze greater change, then all of a sudden they're starting to see change happen much more rapidly. And as we know, habitual patterns are really hard to change. Thought patterns are really hard to change. And so what's, what's interesting is that the neural underpinnings of what help uh, psychedelics support depression and help heal anxiety and depression and PTSD, it's just neural loops are you know strengthening of neural pathways that go around and around and around that's where we get stuck in those ruts and that's where the majority of the conversation is focused in the psychedelic space right now but that same neural underpinning is also what supports cognitive flexibility and creative problem solving and so most of the conversation just isn't focused there right now but i believe it's definitely going in that direction so for a personal example one of the things that i've really noticed is um my capacity. So one of the modules I teach in my course is teaching people about flow states and mm. how to leverage microdosing and flow triggers to really expand that channel of creativity so that, you know, if you're a content creator, if you're 
um, sitting down to write at the computer or you're writing your book, whatever it is that you're doing that you can really leverage the input versus output and also you know, stay connected to that, that the mystery of how spirit creates through us or whatever language you wanna work, we use around that. But when I started a, another round of a protocol a couple of years ago, I was in the middle of taking an online course and I was noticing that when I started the course, my notes, I'm, I'm like an avid note taker. So it was like, you know, always taking notes on everything that's being said. And, and I noticed my, my notes are very linear. And then as I started microdosing and watching the program, the online program, I noticed the transformation between linear notes to complete mind mapping and my note taking time cut down in half. I was able to understand information much more rapidly and I was able to retain it and remember it much more efficiently. And so I've noticed for me, huge cognitive enhancements in terms of how fast I learn, how much I understand. I'm the kind of person that I need to read the same thing over again, or I'll watch the same videos over again. I'm not like I, you know, my sister, for example, she's like the type of person she'll just like listen to something and she'll just retain it. I'm not really like that. So I, I have to kind of work harder. You know, I always had to work hard in school and really, you know, sweat through a lot of that, um, that experience. And so I noticed a huge sort of cognitive jump in terms of my capacity to learn more quickly, retain more information and more, and, and, and not just, you know, quicker learning, better understanding and um, better memory recall. But the most important thing that I noticed was that um, I could make new connections that I was not seeing other people make. And so while I was going through that, I really birthed like the most successful retreat of my career because I started building a framework connecting dots between quantum physics and psychedelic states and Eastern philosophy, particularly the path of the bodhisattva. And I was mind mapping a lot of things out and understanding neuroplasticity and understanding the way that our, my mind works, the way that my body runs on habitual patterns. Um, I was really connecting a lot of different dots in the space. And I was also actively working with psychedelics at that time um, as I was creating this framework and taking what I learned and then tapping into visionary states and going into al altered states of consciousness and watching my mind make connections and watching it happen. And then, you know, 40 people came together for my next retreat where I prepared like crazy for that, you know, and I, ended up sharing a framework that I really has changed my life. And now I'm also moved that online and uh, created modules that people can, can, uh, you know, do groups with me in terms of, of, of an online space because of the, the retreat conundrum that many of us are in right now. And so, and doing it through microdosing rather than, you know, really full blown uh, psychedelic journeys. Wow. So you're still able to connect with people though like that's uh that's that's pretty awesome mm -hmm. um so one of the things that that we had talked about the other day that i wanted to to touch on um was in an article that you had posted uh talking about like basically vetting your shaman if you're going to mm -hmm. be doing an experience and you have so much experience in this space and so much good information that um like I guess if if somebody's looking to do something like this, you know, what are some things to watch out for? Yeah, um, well, I definitely recommend maybe if you have show notes for these podcast episodes, you can include the link for that. Um, yes. There's over 40 questions. And, you know, I, I'm such a believer that it's not a coincidence that as the world is literally falling apart right now, and we face crisis on so many fronts, that we're also witnessing the explosion of interest in psychedelics and plant medicines. Right. And so overall, I think it's really positive. I think that they have their own intelligence, their own agenda. They're like, okay, these humans are really fucking shit up right now. And we need to like help the situation. Yeah. And then in that, you know, it's this interesting time of like the old systems and the old paradigms sort of bleeding into like, we're trying to change out of that. So, you know, I think so much that is happening 
is built on top of these old systems, these old outdated systems, our monetary system, I mean, so much. So of course, you know, you're gonna have people both on the Western side and the indigenous side wanting to make profit from this. And I, I see the conversation often very one-sided that, you know, a lot of people are outraged that white people are pouring medicine or holding psilocybin space and that they have no right doing that. And I sort of, um, go beyond the, the where someone came from and more like, do you have the capacity to do it? And I think, you know, do you, are you qualified? And there's no, there's no standard that says you went through this training and, you know, people are going down to Peru and doing shamanic trainings in two days or three days or two weeks. And, you know, of course it's a joke and it's not enough time that I, I don't even actually really know very many shamans because what it means to be a shaman is, someone who's been on this path from birth until, you know, for decades and who really legit knows how to tap into these spirit worlds and that knows how to hold space for other people. And there's way too many people who are drinking medicine and ayahuasca and experiencing 5-MeO DMT and then boom, the next weekend they're like in a service role. And I think people just need to slow their role a little bit and, you know, just know that um, and good intentions. It's like, it's okay. People will have good intentions and some people don't. I know, I know shamans from indigenous backgrounds who are doing some really horrible things. And so it doesn't make it, uh, it uh, skin color and, you know, persona can be deceiving. And so it doesn't matter for me. I'm less on the like, oh, are they brown? Are they white? Are they, you have no right? Not, that's not my conversation. My conversation is like, do you really know that you have what it takes to hold space for people when things happen? You know, people, it's a lot for the psyche to digest, uh, you know, psychotic breaks happen, momentary psychotic breaks happen. People really, you know, it's a lot, it's a lot of energy, you know? So it's like one way I describe it is like, there is an electrical current that we're exposed to in all the time. And when we open up that field and lift that veil, you're like plugging yourself into like a socket in some sense. And, and if you don't know how to channel that energy and ground it and be like, okay, I hold my seat. I know how to channel this in the right way. Then, you know, things go awry and not a lot of people know how to hold space for that. So I just really urge people, if you are looking to sit with someone, a practitioner, you know, doesn't even have to be a quote unquote shaman, a facilitator, a guide, someone who is taking responsibility to look after you during a, a psychedelic trip, then I really highly recommend that you ask them how much experience they have, how long have they been working with these medicines? You know, do they have teachers? Do they have someone who's been supporting them on their journey? Um, you know, also asking like, especially around certain ceremonies, like if someone's just accepting you into the ceremony without giving you a medical intake, you know, we run medical intakes for all of our microdosing programs. And again, you know, when, just as a side note disclaimer, I'm not encouraging people to microdose and, you know, I'm, I'm supporting people who are already choosing to do that. And so it's for, my program is for educational purposes only, but I still take the step of creating um, a, a medical intake so that you know, if anyone is thinking about working with psychedelics, I also do consulting for people who are just new to the space and they're like, what do I do? And so I'll drop in with them for an hour and kind of get a sense, like, what are you working with? What are your intentions? What are you most drawn to? And I also do medical intake for that as well, because if there's any big red flags, they it's good for them to know about that. You know, so if your shaman or facilitator or guide is not asking you any medical questions, that's a big red flag. And especially with the psychedelic space and the ayahuasca space right now, you can find a ceremony to meet every need. You can find traditional ceremonies with only Spanish singing. You can find very neo-shamanistic ceremonies. You can find ceremonies now where people play electronic music and have a dance party. And I don't recommend that. Um, but there's a flavor for everyone. And so you kind of have to really use discernment in terms of like, what are you feeling called to work with someone who has a lot of experience, a lot of integrity, and you can just ask a few questions. And by the way that they answer, that's really uh, will give you a good indication of, of who they are, how they hold space and how much you trust them, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Trust is a, trust is a big deal. Yeah.
Mm-hmm. Um, what was the the technique that you were talking about earlier that you said you were going to get into? Uh, which technique? Uh, you you mentioned it briefly. It was something that you would come up with. Oh, just the framework that I've created. I mean, that's that's really a, a, a you know like a year long program. Oh, okay. <laughs> able to, to dive into. I got you. Yeah, we won't get into yeah. that. Mm-hmm. Well, it's mostly just the framework of teaching people how to uh, create more mind body alignment and how uh, to hold a vision of what they want to create and then what that means to embody it and how to work with plant medicines or psychedelics, especially through microdosing, because when we work with psychedelics, we have a heightened state of mental flexibility. So mm-hmm. it's like I said, you know, for some people, it's great. They want to microdose and go to work. And I, the way that I teach it is like, microdose and then creating a morning practice that's really leveraging meditation and movement and intentions and ceremony and bringing more of the sacred into our lives and opening the creative channel and how we tap into flow and um under and so i i explain really there's a, a lot of information there that goes from biology to psychology to you know flow states to i touch on quantum physics because that's something that really interests me and I'm not talking like Deepak Chopra quantum physics. I'm talking about like, like actually quantum physicists and what they're writing about quantum physics and what's being um, discovered right now. And even though, you know, a lot of the spiritual teachers who are, they are bringing a lot of accurate information into the, the, the space, but they're about quantum physics. There, there is a very strong like spiritual woo component that isn't necessarily validated. So I more just offer the bonus of like, what neuro or what quantum physics has been discovering about like what we actually know and you know even in the the space of quantum physics there's a huge amount of disagreement still about what things mean especially around the observer effect and does our mind really affect matter and you know what does the science and the research really say about that and so i'm i'm more like in this whole process i'm not saying like i know the way or i have all the answers it's more like this is what I'm finding really interesting right now. And it's like really helping me. And so if you guys want to check this out, that's great. And if not, that's cool. And then while we do the programs, we also do once a week of integration calls so that people can be able to process their experience. Because even though it's microdosing, still a lot, a lot comes up, you know, we're still tapping into the subconscious mind. And I teach people specific meditation practices for tapping into alpha theta brainwave states and that's in the root access into the subconscious mind and very specific visionary practices and um i get into uh, yeah brainwave states what it means um how we're designed for survival i t- i get really deep into the neuroscience of perception because that's such a big component you know perception is everything the way that we perceive a situation is is what makes your life pleasant or unpleasant happy or miserable you know and so when people understand these mechanisms, it's like the analogy I use is like, you know, a lot of people replay out the same patterns over and over and over again over their lives. And it's like, you're stuck in a glass jar and you keep hitting the glass, but you don't recognize that the glass is there. Information is the catalyst to embodied experience. And so it's like giving people knowledge, but we have so much information that people aren't embodying it. So this practice of mind-body alignment is like, taking this information and raising ourselves up out of the jar and being able to actually have more meta awareness, awareness of how, you know, self-knowledge so that we can hold the jar in our hand and, you know, fill it with coconut water and good things that taste good and use it to our advantage. You know, it's like, and these are all tools, everything, the psychedelics are all tools, they're all allies. And just like anything, you know, I consider psychedelics to be somewhat like a knife. You can take that and carve a masterpiece, but you, you can also do harm with it. And so mindfulness about how it's being used, how it's being wielded, you know, yeah. in, in, in what kind of power you're using to do that. Yeah. How, how, long, how long ago did you start seeing the psychedelic resurgence coming? Oh, I mean, I was really starting to see the narrative change. Um, I was just on a, another interview with someone else, another friend of mine who does a lot of um, summits and psychedelics and business. And, you know, we were laughing about this because we have very similar stories. And it took like years of preparing my mind and my body to step out publicly about my relationship to plant medicines. 
Mm. And the plants were telling me for a long time, like, okay, this is where it's going. Because I started off leading transformational retreats um, more in health and wellness. You know, we had these beautiful gardens. I wrote a book that was focused on um, helping people heal their relationship to food. I wrote Mindful Eating for Dummies. That was uh, in this whole timeline of chronology of events of my life. I also went back to school and got a degree in nutritional uh, in nutritional counseling. And so that was really where it kind of started. But then as I was also working with medicines and having other people come and pour medicine and helping to assist and facilitate that, that's where I saw all the transformation happen happening. And my own transformation too, it was like 10X catalyzed, you know, for behavioral change. I've struggled with addiction in my life. And so I started with my transformational retreats being very, uh, very strongly focused on helping people reconnect to their food source and the earth. And that is still definitely a part, a component of it. But um, yeah, over the years, I was preparing myself and the medicines I felt like were telling me, okay, you're going to be stepping out and talking about this. And it was during the volcanic eruption. It was actually about six months before the volcanic eruption. Um, so being in the food space, I'd always been a big fan of Michael Pollan's work, you know, the omnivore's dilemma, you know, he, uh, food rules, like he was writing about food. Yeah. And then I got a message from someone saying, Michael Pollan is releasing his book, How to Change the Mind in six months. And that night I had a dream that was all green lights. And I've had that dream only twice in my life. And the first time was when we saw our first 10 acres of land. And I knew that that was the land we were going to build on. And I went home and slept and had this dream of driving down the road and green light. And then I'm driving down the road and the, the light's going from red to green. And when I heard Michael Pollan was coming out with the book on psychedelics, How to Change Your Mind, I knew that next morning I said, okay, I'm getting ready to go from you know sharing about my food recipes on Instagram to sharing about what my transformation has been with ayahuasca, with psilocybin, that I've been working with plant medicines for almost two decades, and it's been the number one catalyst in my life. And I've never shied away from not talking about it, but it just wasn't the focus of my brand or you know my my what I'm creating online. And so, um, yeah, I, I, I saw the shift and I foresaw the tidal wave that my, Michael Pollan's book was going to make in the psychedelic community. I totally saw it coming. And since his book has come out, it has changed. It's been one of the biggest, I mean, like marked in history as like one of the biggest game changers, oh, yeah. um, you know, for, for the psychedelic space. And of course, you know, pay homage to Rick Doblin at MAPS, who has been decades on the ground working for the vision of, you know, and now the decriminalization movement. I mean, it's just a huge wave. And there's been millions of people or thousands of people who have been under the surface, you know, working towards this for years. But Michael Pollan was in a unique position to come out with a very, you know, non-biased sort of writing about it. And so he he really changed it. And now it is what it is for better and worse. And we have to try to minimize the damage of people, you know, just, I mean, and it's like that being said, you know, I would be a hypocrite to say that I don't feel like recreational use has a place. You know, I used to get on a motorbike and motorbike in like traffic in Asia while I was like high on LSD, like a lot of LSD. I would get on my surfboard and go surf like in really high swell, you know, while I was tripping. And, and it actually taught me how to tune in and understand my body. And, and I do not recommend that at all. You know, I've like yeah. been lost in the forests and the jungles of Asia with nothing but a freaking candle and a light and, you know, high on, it's just like, and so I've made it out of those, thank God. And you know, I don't, I, I think that there's a place for the medical model. I support the medical model in terms of that. And of course, I like to also remind people that millions of people have tripped, tripped successfully with psychedelics for thousands of years without having a doctor present. And we are in different times. We live in a time where there is a mental health crisis, an unprecedented mental health crisis. Over a third of people are struggling with depression or you know suicide rates at all times all time highs so we need more medical support but there's also a huge amount of quote unquote healthy normals and 
everyone is dealing with trauma, but there are ways to learn how to process trauma and, you know, work with a therapist. I think that's great. You know, work with trauma therapists, somatic therapists. Um, I think all of these, these ways, and I, I'm just not a believer that there's only one way that there is a right. lot of different ways. Yeah. A lot. Yeah. <laughs> what, which, which plant medicine has been uh, most healing for you? I mean, I've, really had a very full range of just a lot of benefits. I consider ayahuasca to be my primary plant teacher, but for the first like 10 years of working very deeply, you know, high dose psilocybin was my primary teacher, taught me so much, especially around how to take myself less seriously, you know, how to enjoy the ride, how to, you know, it's just like we live in this narrow box that you got to like, do it this way, grow up and go to school and then have 2.4 children and live in a box. And, you know, I haven't, yeah, it's just, it's like, it's really taught me to think outside the box. And, um, and now I live in a bus instead of a box, but that aside, and then I went really deep with um, LSD. And I know there's some people who have questioned about the, the chemical component constituent of that. And yeah, it's definitely uh, interesting to consider it being a chemical, but it does originate from ergot, which is a plant, and everything is a compound, you know, so, um, but I had really positive life-changing experiences on LSD as well, and then I came and found ayahuasca, and the, that day, I just knew that there was no going back in terms of, you know, I mean, I still work with other psychedelics, but, you know, I still enjoy Washuma, I've also experienced 5-MEO, uh, but ayahuasca, the, the process of the ceremony, I feel like for me is where I get like my deepest healing. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. what's, what's your stance on um, macro and micro in terms of, uh, you know, which one you, you've seen the most um, change with, like positive change? I mean, like, higher doses for sure but microdosing is also a really powerful integration tool mm. you know i guess um that's an interesting question because okay there's this really great quote i can't remember who it's by but it's like the the and it's really long it's like a paragraph long so i'll just synthesize it in my own words paraphrase it um but it's this notion that peak experiences with psychedelics is like getting helicoptered to the top of the mountain mm. right and that we have the false sense of belief that we did the work to get there, but it was like a substance that got us there. And so some people are like, you know, you need to meditate every day to get to the top of the mountain and you shouldn't work with psychedelics, you should do this. And it's like, I'm kind of like a both and, like yeah. getting, you know, having those experiences where you blast through the veil, you get a much bigger perspective on your life, on what's important to you, on what matters. And then, you know, after enlightenment, do the laundry. It's like. <laughs> meditate and do your yoga practices and do the practices that work for you whether it's qigong or aikido or dance movement mindfulness practices though and so the microdosing for me is like the slow and steady climb up the mountain and the deep dives are like the get to the top of the mountain look at yourself climbing up the mountain and give yourself really good advice yeah. for how to keep going every day you know so that's that's the perspective that i take on it that's such a good analogy because you still got to climb up a mountain no matter yeah. what, and, you know? Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. such a good one. I like that. It's like 100 degrees in here, so I'm just like rising. Oh. <laughs> there's like a, a heat wave happening and I'm in a place recording with no air conditioning. That's fine. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's sort of my um, my take on on both ends. And if you're going to start doing deep dive with psychedelics, then you really should be careful because it's not a joke. Yeah. Yeah. You got to be willing to look at what's, what's there, what's under the hood, what's in your mind. And not everyone feels comfortable doing that. Very much so. Um, what is, what's something you're really hopeful about when it comes to this, uh, this creativity route that, that, that you're studying, that you're going to? Only hopeful that it's going to help save humanity. Hey. I mean, I think at this point, if you're not paying attention to that conversation, the precipice that we are collectively all on right now, then you're paying attention to the wrong news feed. 
yeah. you know, stop scrolling Facebook and start actually understanding what's going on with, you know, we're on the precipice here. Mm-hmm. And there's been five mass extinctions of humans on this planet and we're facing the sixth one. And the only difference now is that this one is human precipitated. It's human made. And if we don't change our ways that our children and our children's children are not going to have clean air to breathe or water to swim in or water to drink. And so I think I'm very hopeful about the ways that I think psychedelics and plant medicines can help us look at new solutions and find new solutions to the most complex challenges we face because everything is more interconnected than ever before. It's more complicated. And so we need, it's like Einstein's quote, you know, we can't solve the problems at the same level of thinking that we created them. And that's why I believe that psychedelics need to come and shake up that snow globe so that we can fundamentally shift our perception of reality. And even so, that's why I teach people understanding how do we perceive, how do we create what we see? Because when you know that everyone perceives differently in terms of, you know, you go to an event and everyone has a different experience, why is that? You know, and we have a, a shared experience, depends on how philosophical you want to get in this conversation. But it's, it is, it, you know, it w- all hands on deck is what I'm feeling. <laughs> you know, and all the support that we can need. And we need to look for support in very unconventional ways right now. Yeah, very much so. Yeah, the one of the more frustrating things about it is just seeing all the the unnecessary hate that goes that goes towards it, because it, there's just no understanding there. And it's and it seems like there's, there's a certain a certain amount of people that just don't want to understand but like you said it's an all hands on deck thing like we got like there's no more excuses at this point you know well i also feel like if people don't genuinely feel a pull to work with psychedelics i would not force anyone or try to convince anyone into it i agree and you know just everyone do the best that you can at being a human being living on this planet that we share with so many billion other people and i really just you know there's this call out culture public shaming culture that's running rampant and like fuck that you know what like we instead of taking each other down we can learn to be civil humans and have conversations and we can learn to understand where people are coming from and we can't hold other people accountable because it's like accountable according to whom you want to hold someone accountable to them then it's a dictatorship and they are running what their you know reality based on what they believe to be true we need to hold a wider perspective in this polarized time that we live in and this very divided time that we live in and do what we can to mend bridges to bring people towards greater sense of understanding and connection and so if people don't understand or disagree with psychedelics that's fine that's fine i'm not trying to convince anyone of anything do what you think is best for you Trust your wisdom of your heart. If things are going to change on your path, they're going to change. And if, you know, if you're genuinely unhappy with the state of affairs in your life and the lives of those around you, then maybe be open to looking at alternative solutions because right now we really need to look outside the box. Much so. That was very well said. Um, If people want to follow along to, to see what you're getting into, to, to look at your resources, to, to, to get into your classes, like er- everything that you got going on, where can they find you? Uh, Live Free Laura D is my website and it's also my Instagram handle. And those are my two main sort of outlets. Um, I'm also launching my podcast December 1st. So depending on when you're leading, uh, listening to this, um, my podcast is called Medicine for Change. And, um, but everything, my website, Live Free Laura D is sort of the home base home base for me. And then I do, I'm pretty active, um, on, on the Instagram channel. Awesome. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, well, was there, was there anything else that you wanted to get into today that, um, that you really wanted to touch on? I, I, I feel like we, we got into a lot, but I'm, I'm getting yeah. whatever. You know what? I feel like we just ended on a really good note. That feels yeah. really good. It, it does feel really good. Same here. And, uh, thank you so much for for doing this and uh, sharing your wisdom with with me and anybody else who is listening to this i think it's uh i think it's important given the current times and where we're going so 
Thank you, Ryan. I appreciate it. Thanks for inviting me on to the show. Absolutely. Hope you enjoyed it, people. We are out of here. See ya.